Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, some security aspects of DRAM. Uh, specifically, uh, most of this talk is focused on Rohammer since it's been the major security problem with DRAM. But I will also uh, try to generalize a little bit toward the end, uh, talking about some other emerging technologies potentially. Uh, I usually start uh, this lecture by showing this example of a bridge. And this looks like a very nice bridge. It used to be the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Uh, uh, very close to Seattle, essentially. And one day, a bit flip happened to it, and that bridge uh, fell like this. This is called the Galloping Yardy. You can read about it. Essentially, it had a reliability problem that manifested itself as a safety or security problem. Clearly, uh, you, once you look at this picture, you would think there is some safety and security issue. Uh, and uh, hopefully, this talk will talk about similar bit flips that happen in our computing infrastructure. Clearly, uh, bridges are infrastructure. People have been designing bridges, human beings have been designing bridges for thousands of years, uh, and still we have these accidents. But I would argue that uh, the computing infrastructure that we have today is a whole lot more important and potentially more safety critical, and clearly def much more widespread than bridges. We're using computing everywhere in our lives. And if we keep having bit flips in our memories, then we're gonna have a significant security and safety troubles in addition to reliability troubles. I also like using this example where these workers are constructing a city after some war and basically they're happy right now, but uh, once, they, once they experience a bit flip on this rod, they may not be happy in the next moment. And I like this very general definition of uh, security in general. It's clearly very, very general, but if we can achieve this definition of security, then I believe we would be fully secure, meaning we should really be able to design systems that can even prevent unforeseen consequences. A bit flip may not be foreseen, but if you could actually adapt your system such that it can fix that bit flip dynamically after those bit flips are discovered, then wouldn't that be nice? Okay, so that is a prelude to Rohammer. And a Rohammer, as you may have read, is the fact that you can predictably induce bit flips in commodity DRAM chips using a particular failure mechanism. And the first time we stumbled into this, we found out that more than 80% of the DRAM chips that we tested were vulnerable to this effect. And a whole lot did not change uh, since that time. So I will give you a history of it also. Importantly, this is the first example that I know of how, uh, how a simple hardware failure mechanism can create a widespread system security vulnerability. This connection between reliability and security has been long thought about, but uh, Rohammer puts a concrete first example to it uh, in a real world setting, let's say. And as a result, uh, people are writing articles that look like this, forget software, now hackers are exploiting physics, referring to Rohammer. And I think this is a very nice high level characterization of what Rohammer is all about. It's really about the physics. It's really about the electrons and uh, the circuit level structures and uh, faults in those circuit level structures and how to exploit them. Okay, so uh, this brings me uh, to, well, sorry, uh, somehow my computer is racing ahead of me. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the reliability issues with memory has been long known, right? There's no, nothing new about reliability in memory. This is a position paper that we were invited to write to International Memory Workshop in 2013, where we argued that these reliability issues were going to get much worse. We didn't actually, we were investigating Rovehammer, but we didn't really release the results at that point in yet. And we were arguing for a systems architecture perspective, meaning we need to think holistically about these issues. And I will argue for that in this uh, presentation as well. Uh, and we argued that basically, uh, we, we were focused on especially the DRAM technology. DRAM is the prevalent main memory technology. It's essentially used all, all, in all computers that have main memory today. And if you look at DRAM, uh, it's a charge-based memory technology. It stores charge in a capacitor. And this capacitor must be large enough for reliable sensing. And the access transistor must be large enough for low leakage and high retention time. And as you reduce the size of the circuitry, both of these properties become more difficult to maintain. So you get higher leakage, and you, are, you have basically lower retention times as well. So you'll, you'll have sensing issues as well. And Rohammer is, a, uh, is one incarnation of one of the problems uh, that happens when you reduce the size of the circuits. And also when you reduce the size of the circuits, cells become closer to each other as well. So you become more vulnerable to various noise effects that are fundamentally in the circuit. And uh, essentially, this is a technology scaling problem. And I believe all scaled main memory technologies have this sort of effects. Uh, read disturbance, write disturbance, and Rohammer is a disturbance effect, as we will see. And reliability of memory, uh, we were, we've been investigating this for a while. Uh, this is one study that we did with Facebook uh, over the course of 2012 to 2015. 
And we analyze all of the memory errors that Facebook actually used in all of their systems, that they have a lot of systems. There's actually a lot of large scale data. And basically we found this correlation. This correlation shows that, uh, show the chip density that's employed in a server versus the relative server failure rate normalized to some metric, which you should look at the paper to really understand the metric. Uh, uh, because it, it requires a lot of normalization across different servers. And, and the key takeaway is as chip density, uh, the chip density positively correlates with the server failure rate because you get more memory errors uh, with uh, larger uh, chip densities. Why? Because cells are smaller in chips with larger capacities or larger densities and cells are closer to each other. So there are many, many noise effects. And uh, clearly we, were, we and other people were studying memory errors. And this, if you're interested in memory errors at this large scale perspective, you can take a look at this paper. Uh, so uh, we, were scale, we were studying a lot of scaling issues in DM. We, we built infrastructures to study these scaling issues at the, uh, let's say, small scale as well. So these are FPGA-based infrastructure. The bottom right one over here is the first infrastructure that we built where we have FPGAs attached to a computer with heaters and to, uh, to enable cooling, et cetera. But the idea was to, uh, the reason we built these infrastructures was to scale, uh, study these scaling issues like retention errors. I will mention that before I jump into Rohammer actually. Uh, and uh, these infrastructures enable us to test memory to understand its different properties. For example, the retention properties of different cells, the latency properties of different cells, reliable latency properties. If you, if you change the voltage, what happens to uh, different latencies, for example. These are very interesting studies in my opinion. So the reason we built this infrastructure was not to, actually study row hammer to begin with. It was really to study retention issues, which is an important scaling issue with DRAM because as you reduce the size of the cell, the amount of charge you store is low, becomes lower. And as a result, the amount of time uh, the DRAM cell retains the data becomes lower and lower. So you need to refresh the memory much more often to actually avoid the charge leakage. And this is a big problem in terms of performance and energy. And we wanted to solve that problem. And we, we actually worked on that problem a lot uh, concurrently with row hammer as well. Okay, so uh, let me actually mention this infrastructure. This is actually where we did a lot of the Rohammer testing. This is a more scaled up infrastructure that enables us to test many memory chips concurrently. Uh, and we actually released this infrastructure as an open source infrastructure, which is actually good, uh, re relatively easily programmable using the C++ API. And we will release a newer version of it soon as well. Uh, but you can download this older version that, you, that can test DDR3 chips. And uh, we'd be happy to support it. And we'd be happy to get any feedback to improve the infrastructure as well. Okay, so this infrastructure enabled us to study a lot of interesting things uh, in uh, memory. As I said, data retention is interesting. I will give you a picture of the data retention. Uh, data retention, basically, it, it, because DRAM is charge-based, charge leaks, as a result, you need to uh, refresh memory uh, uh, periodically. Today, the refresh rates are on the order of 64 milliseconds or 32 milliseconds. At high temperatures, they could be 16 milliseconds. Basically, every 16 milliseconds, you refresh every single cell in DRAM. Clearly, this is an energy problem and performance problem. But what we wanted to analyze with our infrastructure is, do we really need to do that? Basically, do we really need to refresh every cell uh, at the worst case refresh rate? And the, it turns out you don't have to. Basically, that's what one of the uh, uses of this infrastructure is for. You can test the memory. You can figure out what are the worst case retention times for different DRAM cells. And at the time we did the study, we found out that almost, well, I, 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 would, I would say that almost all of the DRAM cells are stronger than the weakest DRAM cells, meaning, you don't need to refresh everything every 64 milliseconds. You can actually uh, increase the refresh rate, uh, reduce the refresh rate for most DRAM cells by 4x. And this could buy you a lot of energy and performance clearly as we showed in our papers. But of course, it's not easy to do. It requires a lot more characterization of the cells because clearly this re retention time is dependent on the location. And this happens because of the manufacturing variation between the different cells. Some cells are more leaky, some cells are less leaky because they're their capacitors may be strong or weak or small. Uh, it can capture less charge. Access transistors may be weak or strong. So because of that manufacturing variation, this is very much location dependent. It's also very much dependent on stored values, uh, which values are stored in this cell as well as the surrounding cells, because that affects the charge leakage out of the cell. This also very much depends on time. There are some quantum-like effects that cause the retention time of a cell to change suddenly uh, because of, again, quantum-like interactions in the circuit. This is called a variable retention time phenomenon in DRAM. Uh, so it's actually not an easy problem to exploit this phenomenon. That's why we actually uh, started writing a lot of interesting papers that experimentally analyze the data retention behavior of DRAM. This was the first paper we wrote. And then we basically tried to understand how can we actually uh, mitigate the retention issues and uh, get to a better place where we don't need to refresh everything very often. How do you solve the variable retention time problem? 
uh, how do you solve the data dependency problem? I'm not talking, I'm going to go and talk about this, but people may be interested in this. And there may be security vulnerabilities here also. This is something that we have not explored as much, uh, but this is something to be looked at, as I will later also mention. Basically, how do you mitigate the DRM retention failures? Uh, and there are some more recent papers, as you can see. Manufacturers more recently incor started incorporating error correction codes in DRAM to combat some of these scaling issues that include some of the retention time issues, actually, because they found out that some of the retention time issues are very difficult to handle. Some cells will leak their charge and you get data corruption in the end, which could be exploited as a security and safety problem, clearly. So they started incorporating in DRAM, in memory chip, error correcting codes. And we're going to get back to this error correcting codes as a potential solution to Rohammer. It's a great, I, I, I believe this is a, a, an idea in the right direction for retention faults that are more randomly occurring. But it may not be an idea in the right direction for Rohammer, uh, which we will see is not randomly occurring. It's really based on a specific access pattern, as we will see. But if you're interested, there are a lot of papers on retention time issues, and this may actually cause some security vulnerabilities. Who knows? And if you're interested, there are lectures that we deliver on this topic also. And I, find, I still find this retention time of memory fascinating. Okay, with that background, basically, I think this is an example of things that you can enable with if you build this sort of infrastructure that enables you to test cutting edge uh, memory chips. And while we were doing these retention time studies, we also asked, the, uh, we, actually, we actually had a, a separate infrastructure on flash memory as well. And we were looking at disturbance issues in flash memory. And there's a lot of read disturbance that happens in flash memory. So we were inspired to examine disturbance issues in DRAM as well. So together with Intel, actually, we did some studies where we found out that you can predictably induce errors in most DRAM memory chips. And that's really the, how, how Rohammer analysis came about. And Rohammer is, a, as I said, a simple hardware failure mechanism that can create a widespread system security vulnerability. And uh, I encourage you to read the article that I showed you. Uh, so what is it basically? So if you look at DRAM, it consists of rows of uh, cells, many, many rows. Actually, almost all memories look like this today. Uh, and basically, if you activate one row, which means you apply high voltage to the word line so that you can read something from that row, you open the row, uh, you, uh, you can read that read data from that row. Okay, uh, if you want to read data from some other row, you normally deactivate this row. This is called pre-charge in DRAM, apply low voltage to that word line. Now it turns out if you keep doing this repeatedly over and over, apply high voltage, low voltage, high voltage, low voltage, high voltage, low voltage, activate pre-charge, activate pre-charge, activate pre-charge, activate pre-charge pre to the same row, physically adjacent cells in physically adjacent rows get corrupted. Not all cells, a fraction of the cells get corrupted. Uh, these cells are called Rohammer vulnerable cells. Clearly, this should not happen, right? This is happening because there's some disturbance effect uh, that uh, corrupts these rows. Uh, why should this not happen? Because we're not changing anything in DRAM. We're not even writing to DRAM. We're just activating a row, which essentially reads that row and puts the value into the sense amplifiers. So we, you should not change any value in DRAM, let alone values in unrelated rows. So that's why this is important. It's breaking memory isolation, basically. We call this the hammered row. We call these the victim rows. And we showed that more than 80% of the chips that we tested that were manufactured by three major DRAM manufacturers, and they're really only three major DRAM manufacturers that cover more than 95% of the DRAM market today, are vulnerable to this. And we studied the dates of uh, these chips. And basically, you can see that this is a technology scaling problem. Uh, the errors did not appear in chips that were manufactured before 2010. The errors started appearing uh, in 2010. Basically, uh, cells became smaller and closer to each other as technology scaled down. And as a result, you could do enough activates to induce these bit flips before the cells get refreshed. In the past, you couldn't do cause enough activates uh, to induce these bit flips, uh, uh, Rohammer bit flips, because the, uh, the cells would get refreshed because actually, before you could actually uh, you before you could do enough activates to induce the bit flips, but uh, a time uh, with technology scaling, the number of activations you could uh, fit in a refresh interval that would cause the uh, uh, bit flips uh, would become feasible within a refresh interval essentially. And you can see that all of the modules that we tested between 2012 and 2013 were vulnerable. And again, uh, this was not the best attack. So we will see later on in this talk that. You could actually make the attacks even more powerful if you know the layout of the DRAM cells and if you could actually squish one victim row between two aggressor rows. I will mention that uh, later. 
So you may ask questions over here. Why are some of the chips not vulnerable that are manufactured in 2014? Because maybe we did not have the best attack against them. Okay, so why is this happening? Very uh, qu quickly, DRAM cells are too close to each other. They're not electrically isolated from each other. And access to one cell affects the value in nearby cells due to electrical interference between the cells, as well as the wires used for accessing the cells. And this is also called the cell-to-cell -cell coupling and interference. Uh, and a high-level example is that when we activate uh, high volt, uh, meaning apply high voltage to a row, an adjacent row gets slightly activated as well. This is one potential cause. And in vulnerable cells, in that slightly activated row, lose a little bit of charge. And if row hammer happens enough times before the cells get refreshed, charge in such cells get drained uh, before, uh, basically, you, you, you corrupt the data in the cell uh, and you cannot recover it unless you have error correcting codes that are good enough to recover it. But we will get back to that also. So the high level implications of this in terms of uh, the upper layers uh, of the transformation hierarchy is enormous. Clearly this is a reliability problem potentially, but it's more of a security problem because somebody can maliciously induce these access patterns that can cause these bit flips. As a result, clearly all of the software that's built on DRAM, assuming that this doesn't happen, assuming that memory is reliable, uh, can potentially break. And we showed that it does actually. So in this uh, 2014 paper, we released this code uh, and you can find it on the GitHub. Google has a better version of this code, I would say. Uh, this code, what this code does is it's an x86, uh, uh, user level x86 program. And once you run this code, uh, it basically selects addresses X and Y, such that they're in the same bank as much as possible. It basically uh, alternates activations to X and Y. It bypasses the caches on chip caches because you need to do the activation in DRAM. It bypasses the row buffer in DRAM, such that you do activations uh, in a ping-ponging manner between uh, to X and Y. And if the chip is vulnerable, hopefully you'll get some number of bit flips. Now, uh, this is called single-sided row hammer, but a, a clever approach, which we alluded to in our paper uh, and later Google folks showed, is that you could have X and Y such that there's only one row in between them. That way you would be hammering that poor, uh, poor victim row on both sides. This is called double-sided row hammer, and that would induce even more bit flips. Uh, and that's really the state of the art uh, today. If you would like to maximize the number of bit flips you have uh, in your system, and if you bypass all the protections that we have today uh, for row hammer, then this double-sided row hammer is actually how you can maximize it. Okay, so this is a real system study. And uh, when we did the study in 2012, we basically showed that uh, you could actually get real errors in real systems. Intel and AMD systems are examples. Uh, and uh, errors really correlate with how many activations you really induce and the vulnerability of the DRAM chip as well. So we said that this is a real reliability and security issue. Uh, and uh, when we wrote the paper, our first sentence was, memory isolation is a key property of a reliable and secure computing system and access to one memory address should not have unintended side effects on data stored in other addresses because it breaks memory isolation. I still strongly believe that. And we said that somebody can actually uh, write a, uh, a program that can hijack your computer. We did not do that because we had a lot of other things to do. Uh, and while we were actually looking into that, these good folks from Google Project Zero did exactly that. Basically, they showed that they could exploit these bit flips uh, at a user level program, such that that user level program can gain kernel privileges. And I would really recommend that uh, if people have not looked at it, they have a nice black hat presentation on this. They have a nice blog post. And I, in this slide, I copy and paste uh, from that blog post, but their black hat presentation from uh, Mark Seaborn is actually beautiful. Uh, I'm just going to quickly go over what they did. Uh, nope, sorry. Okay, basically they replicated the problem. They learned about the problem from our paper. They replicated the problem and they basically built work, two working privilege escalation exploits. One of them uh, uh, is very interesting, I would say, because it takes over the uh, x86-64 Linux kernel. Uh, so it is an, you have an unprivileged user level process. It induces bit flips and it's, carefully induces bit flips with the knowledge of the layout of the operating system page tables. And it can induce bit flips and page table entries with, of course, some very clever security engineering. They have to spray page tables all over the memory such that they can maximize the probability of the bit flip happening at the right place. And if you actually flip the right bits in your page table entry, uh, you can gain right access to your own page table as a user level process. And if you can gain right access to your own page table as a user level process, then all bets are off because you know the structure of the page table and the operating system. As a result, you can actually gain uh, privileged access to all of the computer at that point. Of course, it's not as easy as I just said. Uh, you need to do a lot of work uh, to enable this. And uh, that's why I refer you to 
this beautiful black hat presentation by Google. And that's exactly what they reported. Uh, as I say, in this, uh, this is actually copy pasted from their blog post. Okay. And that's uh, when people started becoming more concerned about this. It's called the DRAM Rohammer vulnerability. Uh, and uh, I like this analogy from some uh, hardware security uh, expert, let's say hacker uh, on, on the internet. He wrote on Twitter that it's like breaking into an apartment by repeatedly slamming a neighbor's door until the vibrations open the door you were after. And I think this is a nice analogy to the problem. And later, a lot of interesting papers start appearing, in the, especially the security uh, venues. So these folks from TU Grass showed that you could actually remotely induce these attacks, uh, your rope hammer attacks through JavaScript and gain unrestricted access to systems of website visitors. I'm not going to go through the details of these attacks because these are all really interesting security attacks, but we don't really have time to cover them. Uh, I think they're all fascinating things. Uh, it, it shows you how a bit flip can actually enable a lot of interesting ideas and innovation. These folks from uh, Fry University in Amsterdam basically wrote an app, Android app, uh, where they exploited the uh, predictable memory allocation patterns of the Android operating system to fool the operating system to allocate pages to locations that they knew are vulnerable to Rohammer because this app actually profiled those locations early on. As a result, they, they showed that they can gain control of a smartphone deterministically. So it's very interesting also, and it appeared in CCS, as you can see. Uh, people showed that you could accelerate these attacks using GPUs because GPUs have the capacity to hammer faster and more aggressively many rows. As a result, these folks showed that you could escalate privilege via the WebGL interface in a mobile system using the GPU. Uh, later, people showed that you could actually do these attacks through the RDMA, Remote Direct Memory Access Interface, in a remote computer. And this is an interesting paper. These folks had the same idea, and uh, they did that, and they have another paper. They have a, a concurrent paper with the previous work. Uh, more recently, these folks show that you could actually break confidentiality. Even if you may not be able to escalate privilege, you can uh, break confidentiality and uh, use Rohammer as a way of reading uh, somebody else's memory, essentially, that you're not supposed to read. And this is also important, clearly, because this leads to privacy issues and confidentiality issues. And uh, even again, again, more recently, uh, there are two papers, and maybe there are more, I don't know, but there I will highlight two papers. Two papers show that uh, if you have Rohammer, you can attack a neural network and you can cause specific bit flips in the neural networks. This is the second paper. And a perfectly reasonable neural network inference uh, with high accuracy, let's say 90%, uh, because of these bit flips can become low accuracy, complete low accuracy. And essentially, I would argue that it's useless as these, as these folks also argue in their paper. So these false attacks can happen in your machine learning accelerator or machine learning system, and they can actually uh, turn your uh, system to a, to a completely unsafe and unsecure uh, system that doesn't do uh, the inference that you want it to do. So clearly, neural networks are going to be employed in safety critical systems. And I'm going to skip this, but people also explore doing Rohammer in flash memory as well. This is a paper from IBM Research Zurich, as you can see. Okay, so there could be more security implications, and you can see, you'll see that actually there are more papers coming up on this topic. Uh, maybe this is one other security implication. You get so frustrated that you start hammering your computer. Maybe this is a solution, but this is clearly a joke. It's not a solution, I believe. And uh, uh, we did write an invited paper to uh, a TCAT special issue in topics in hardware and embedded security, uh, where we talked about uh, the Rohammer research at the time. This is, you can see the date over here. It's 2019. It covers a lot of research that has happened in Rohammer, from architecture, from solutions, uh, to, to, secure, uh, to security attacks, as well as modeling of the Rohammer at the device level. Uh, so if you're interested, this gives you a good perspective. But there's more research that has happened since then. And I will, uh, I will talk about that research actually uh, soon. Okay, but before I go into that research, let's try to understand this uh, a little bit first. And that's what we did in our initial paper. And this is the link to the initial paper, as you can see. I believe uh, folks may have read this. Even if you didn't read it, I will cover the basics of it, let's say. So with this infrastructure that we built, we essentially tested a lot of chips. And we tried to understand this problem. And these are the modules that we tested. Again, three major vendors, 128, 29 modules, which amounts to more than 1,000 chips, I believe. I didn't do the calculation recently. Uh, but these are the seven major results that we showed. I'm going to cover a few of them. And clearly, I already said uh, the first two. But let's take a look at uh, some of the other ones. So this is interesting. This is from the memory controller's perspective. Uh, how far away from the memory controller's perspective are the victim and aggressor roles? Uh, 
So if you look at the worst chips from the three different manufacturers, most of the time, aggressor and the victim are uh, the address difference, row address difference between them is just one, meaning they're supposed to be adjacent. But some of the time, uh, the distance is more. Now, uh, there is a reason for this uh, because uh, the, the, the address space that uh, the memory controller sees, uh, the, uh, the row addresses that are linear, the linear row addresses don't necessarily map to adjacent rows because internally DRAM does some remapping of the rows because of fault. For example, DRAM may have fault in one row and they may remap that row to some other location. As a result, consecutive addresses that you see in the memory control in terms of rows may actually be mapped to totally different physical locations. So we don't know basically. We do not have enough visibility to the underlying DRAM microarchitecture. But we, we believe that most of the rows are physically adjacent because uh, physically adjacency is, is a reason why these rope hammer flips are happening. But th this, uh, this, goes, this will affect our solutions because if you want to have a solution in the memory controller to fix the problem, memory controller doesn't have perfect knowledge of which rows are physically adjacent in DRAM. So even though in most cases, uh, a linear, assuming that linear uh, addresses that are linear in the address space of the row address space uh, that's exposed to the memory controller are physically adjacent, that's not necessarily true. Meaning your, your security solution may not be perfect if you do not have this knowledge in the memory controller. The second is the access interval to the aggressor. We vary the access interval uh, in many chips, but I'm plotting the worst chips over here. If you're accessing the chip more frequently, you're basically getting more errors. If you're accessing the chip less frequently, you're getting fewer errors. And there's some uh, frequency that is not allowed, as you can see, because of the DRAM standard. And this is expected clearly. Uh, basically, uh, row hammer happens because you're activating things more frequently or less frequently. And if you're doing that less frequently, uh, you can solve the problem potentially. But this cannot be a good solution because if you say, okay, I'm going to slow down the accesses to DRAM so that I don't have enough activates with a refresh interval to cause this problem, well, you need to really slow down the access to DRAM a lot, meaning every 500 nanoseconds in the worst chips. And this is 2012. 2022 data actually says you need to slow things down even more. So this is not a viable solution unless you apply it some uh, uh, very, very selectively, let's say. And the uh, last example is, uh, well, last actually graph-based result is a refresh interval. At the time we were testing the DRAM chips, the refresh interval, the nominal refresh rate was 64 milliseconds at low temperatures. Now, if you actually refresh more, fre oh, sorry, more frequently, you can reduce the error rate due to row hammer, as you can see over here. If you refresh less frequently, you will increase the error rate. And this makes sense because if you refresh more frequently, you can, you can fit fewer number of activations uh, in a refresh interval. So the probability of row hammer bit flip reduces. And less frequently, you could fit more activations. As a result, probability of row hammer bit flip increases. But to solve this problem purely by increasing the refresh rate, is not a good idea, again, because if you really want to completely eliminate all of the bit flips, our data shows that you need to increase the refresh rate by 7x. And that's a lot, because if you increase the refresh rate, we are trying to get, the reason we built this infrastructure, as I showed you earlier, is to get rid of the refreshes as much as possible. If row hammer, and refresh is one scaling problem of DRAM, it's becoming more common. We want to get rid of it as much as possible. Row hammer is another scaling problem of DRAM. It, if it increases the refreshes, then, if one scaling problem actually makes another scaling problem much worse, then we have a big problem. And clearly refreshes actually have a lot of overhead on the system in terms of performance and, and energy. Okay. And uh, the, the other result that we have in this paper, very similar to retention results, is that data pattern significantly affects uh, the row hammer vulnerability. If your data pattern looks like this, you get fewer errors. So you get 10x, an order of magnitude more errors if your data pattern is exercising the coupling between the cells. So uh, it's really the charge coupling that happens between the cells uh, that are exacerbated uh, with this data pattern over here uh, that you see. Okay. Um, yeah, basically errors are affected by data stored in other cells. That makes, the, that makes the exploitation more interesting and more complicated also. Okay, there are some other key observations I'll go through relatively quickly. So row hammer is a different uh, failure mechanism than charge leakage due to uh, capacitor. Uh, basically, retention weak cells are not the same as row hammer victim cells. There's almost no overlap between them. Errors are repeatable, which makes this a security problem. So basically, we have, uh, if, you, if you can cause row hammer in a cell, you'd be able to cause again and again and again and again and again with high uh, confidence. You get as many as four errors per cache line. As a result, simple error correcting codes cannot prevent all errors. Modern error correcting codes can correct one error and detect two errors. If you get four errors per cache block, then you cannot really 
uh, correct or detect. Uh, in fact, you get confused in the error correction logic sometimes. And uh, as I said, cells affected by two uh, are, cells are affected by two aggressors on either side, and this led to double-sided hammering, which increased the uh, Rolfe-Hammer bit flip rates and Rolfe-Hammer vulnerability even more uh, into the future. Okay, and uh, if you're more interested in more analysis, this is our original paper. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them or I'm happy to continue also, but feel free to interrupt me. <laughs> okay, so later I will show you uh, uh, this more recent paper that shows that Rolfe-Hammer is getting much worse. And uh, basically all aspects of Rolfe-Hammer is getting much worse. I'm gonna talk about that. And Rolfe-Hammer has more dimensions as we will see. It's affected by temperature significantly, for example, uh, but we'll talk about that. And there's one more work coming up in DSN where we try to understand Rolfe-Hammer with word line multi. So understanding Rolfe-Hammer is important. But before I get to those works, let's talk about the solutions of this original work. Uh, and in general, in the field, what was the solution that was employed in the field to begin with, let's say. And uh, we argue that there are two types of Rolfe-Hammer solutions that are important. One is immediate, basically. There are some vulnerable DRAM chips in the field. Immediately, how can you protect them? Clearly, you have limited possibilities today because we do not have a lot of configurability in our memory controllers, as I will argue later on. But the longer term solutions can be uh, even stronger, basically, to protect future DRAM chips. We can have a wider range of protection mechanisms. So in the original paper, we discussed seven solutions in total, and we discussed a solution called Para. It's already employed, variants of it are already employed in the field, but I believe we have better solutions going into the future as we will discuss. So these are some example solutions that we discussed in our original paper. Clearly making better DRAM chips would be nice, but this comes at a cost. Isolating rows comes at a cost, basically. Different materials such that this doesn't happen comes at a cost. And eventually, if you push for storage density, at some point, you get into these disturbance issues. Refreshing frequently, we will cover that. Clearly, this is across the board. This is not desirable. But existing memory controllers have only this sort of configurability that can deal with Rob Hammer. So that's what industry adopted early on. But they didn't increase the refresh rate by 7x because 7x is a bit unreasonable in terms of performance and energy. Sophisticated error correction codes can solve the problem, yes. But this may not be a good idea because error correction codes have huge overhead. And error correction codes are actually a good mechanism to employ in your system if you do not really know why errors are happening, meaning random errors. But if you really know why errors are happening, maybe your old hammer can be sold in an easier way. So access counter-based methods are interesting, actually. Can you keep track of the count of accesses that you do to different rows and refresh rows based on those access counters? And we're going to get back to the solution also. But this is how the industry reacted to this problem, basically. This is Apple's security patch. You can see that Apple actually says, we introduced, we increased the memory refresh rates to solve the row hammer problem, basically. And they were nice enough to cite our paper in their uh, security patch, as you can see. And other industry followed also. They didn't tell you how much they increased the memory refresh rates, but I believe it's 2x. Okay, so our solution, initial solution was probabilistic, basically. The idea is very simple. We want it to be very simple. And at that time, row hammer vulnerability was not that bad, let's say. Today, this idea has more overhead than what we showed initially. So after you close a row in the memory controller, the memory controller activates, in other words, refreshes one or both of its neighbors with very low probability. Probability can be five out of a thousand times. And if you do that, you get a very good reliability guarantee, basically. That's much better than hard disks, essentially, for example. And if you're, let's say, not comfortable, with that, you increase the value of P, basically. This probability increases, and as a result, you get more overhead, yes, but you get better reliability and security guarantees, probabilistic, all of them. Uh, and uh, the good thing with the, of the solution is low power, low performance overhead, as we tested in the benchmarks, and it's stateless, basically. You don't need to keep track of any state. You don't need to keep track of access counters or any sort. You can be completely probabilistic. And we argue that this is an effective and low overhead solution, but we will revisit that later on. And this can be implemented in DRAM chip or the memory controller. And actually, both of the solutions were implemented uh, over time. Today, like variants of it are somewhat implemented in the DRAM chip, maybe not exactly as we envisioned it. But you could, you could exploit the slack in timing and refresh parameters to induce some of these refreshes internally in the DRAM chip. And we showed in other work that there's plenty of slack today. And this other work was also enabled by the infrastructure that we built. You can also implement in the memory controller. That was our proposal. But if you really want to be perfect in this one, you really need to know in the memory controller which rows are physically adjacent. As I said, this is not known to the memory controller perfectly today. But regardless, a version of this was implemented by Intel uh, in their uh, earlier solutions. It's called PTRR, probabilistic TRR. 
And uh, it's a BIOS based mechanism. It's not exactly how we envisioned it, but it's a step in the right direction. As you can see in the BIOS, you can configure your, your Rowhammer solution. You could either pick 2x refresh or hardware Rowhammer protection. And with the hardware Rowhammer protection, you basically figure out your probability, activation probability. In our case, it was basically five out of a thousand times, for example, you could do one out of a thousand times uh, or 2048 times here, basically. That's the selected part over here. So basically these solutions uh, have started making the memory controllers more interesting and more intelligent. And I believe this is a step in the right direction, but unfortunately DRAM manufacturers started implementing their own solutions. And they said basically to the industry that we have DRAM chips that are row hammer free. So you don't need to solve this problem. So we're going to revisit that. We're going to visit that claim soon. Okay. But if you're interested in these solutions and their high level properties, uh, I would encourage you to take a look at the paper. And we argued in the paper that memory controllers, uh, main memory needs intelligent controllers for security, safety, reliability, and scaling. And I still believe that actually. And here I will take a quick aside to talk about NAND flash memory. So NAND flash memory is actually a very unreliable memory technology. If you manufacture NAND flash memory, especially today, most of the cells don't work. What makes it work is the memory control. Essentially the NAND flash controller does a lot of sophisticated error correction, mitigation, and recovery mechanisms to make it work. And if you're really interested in how this works. This is a, I mean, it is a reasonably old paper by now, that, but the fundamentals did not change. Uh, this paper that we wrote uh, into, uh, at the proceeding of the IEEE talks about how these controls correct errors. And we argue that DRAM should become over time similar to flash controllers so that it fixes these errors by itself uh, using uh, memory controller and DRAM uh, cooperation. Okay, so uh, as I said, there are lectures on Rohammer and uh, there are also other papers that we have written. Uh, but now I'm going to come into a more recent work that is not covered in those papers. If there are any questions, again, I'm happy to take it and feel free to interrupt me. Otherwise, I'll just keep going. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about uh, talk, uh, what's happened more recently. So we wanted to revisit uh, our, uh, our analysis of Robhammer. And this paper, we essentially did that. And we had more capable infrastructure. We were able to analyze more than 1,500 chips over here. And these are the takeaways that we have. Newer GM chips are more, much more vulnerable to Robhammer today in 2020 compared to 2012. Uh, they're new, uh, so you get more bit flips and bit flips are happening earlier, meaning there are new chips whose weakest cells fail after only 4,800 hammers, double-sided. So in total, it's 9,600 hammers. This number was 139,000 in 2012 when we, wrote, when we started writing the paper. That was single-sided, but yes, things have reduced by an order of magnitude almost. Chips of newer DRAM technology nodes can exhibit uh, bit flips in more rows and farther away from the victim row. So basically the effect of row hammer is not just the physically adjacent row, but physically next adjacent and next adjacent also. And this may be increasing. And we also showed that existing mitigation mechanisms are not effective at future technology nodes. Why? Because you can cause bit flips very quickly with small number of activations and existing mitigations mechanisms either don't scale or become very high performance overhead. And I'm not going to talk about this in detail. You can read the paper, but this high performance overhead is a problem. For example, Para is a good solution if your Rohammer bit flip, uh, uh, the first Rohammer bit flip you can cause is after 100,000 activations, but it may not be a good solution if you can cause a Rohammer bit flip after only 1,000 activations because you start refreshing things much more frequently that way. So, and, uh, so very quickly to go over what we did in this work is we actually have infrastructures for DDR3, DDR4, and LPDDR4. And we tested chips uh, from different technology nodes. And uh, again, I'm not going to go over this in detail, but we have three major manufacturers, three DRAM types and standards, and two technology nodes for DRAM type. We can do scaling studies this way. And our results are actually very common across uh, different generations and different types of DRAM. So this is one result that I will quickly highlight. Here we look at the hammer count that introduces uh, uh, bit flips and the bit flip rate it introduces across different manufacturers over here and different uh, types of DRAM as well. But the takeaway over here is that Rovhammer bit flip rate increases uh, when you, you go from old to new DDR4 technology generation. Basically, this curve shifts from uh, to the left and goes up. Basically, bit flip rate increases and the hammers uh, bit flips ha start happening earlier, as you can see, in all manufacturers. Okay, I already said this basically. Basically, Rovhammer vulnerability increases with technology generation. And this is another uh, example result from that study that shows that newer DRAM chips are, uh, from each manufacturer are more vulnerable to Rovhammer. Before, for example, you could not cause bit flips, but newer technology nodes, you could cause a lot more bit flips, a lot more frequently. So, so to summarize, for example, uh, the first, uh, the hammer cut that enables you to get to the first, flip reduces, uh, first uh, bit flip reduces significantly. 
uh, from old to new chips. And you can see the real numbers over here. And if you're interested in using some of the data, the paper has a lot of data. Okay, I already said this basically. Even with 4,800 double-sided hammers, you can cause some bit flips. And I think this is reducing. That This was, again, data from 2020. Chips being manufactured from the latest chip manufactured in 2019, for example. Today, we're in 2022. And technology scaling is not helping us. The, the reason uh, many, uh, this is getting worse, row hammer is getting worse, is technology scaling is uh, going well in the sense that we're able to reduce the size of the cells and so we can pack more cells in the same millimeter square. But the noise due to row, uh, row hammer is increasing. As a result, you can hammer things much easier today. And if you're interested in this revisiting Grove Hammer paper, you can actually look at the lectures that we delivered on this topic. Okay, so let me talk about another work where we question the assumption that, or, or claim that uh, DI manufacturers set, uh, provided. And the claim was, we solved the Grove Hammer problem, and they actually uh, made this claim publicly, saying that our chips are Grove Hammer free. They didn't say how. So this was security through obscurity, let's say. They didn't say how, they just said, trust us, basically. And of course, uh, if you see this challenge, any good researcher should probably take on this challenge. Then the question is, should we really trust them, right? Is it really true? And that's what we did basically, collaborating with folks who actually did a lot of research on Rohammer. Uh, we used our infrastructure to really understand what's going on in the DRAM chips. And basically we came up with this trespass solution. So the solution that DRAM manufacturers came up with was called TRR, targeted row refresh. Basically somehow you refresh rows that are affected by Rohammer it's a very general mechanism. There is not much known about it, except for some patents potentially, but patents don't necessarily make into products clearly. So there's not much known about what's really implemented in real chips, except this work was the first to uncover that. So basically we showed that uh, this claim doesn't hold. Existing chips that are TRR protected or claim to be protected are still vulnerable to row hammer in the field. Mitigations advertised as secure are not secure because you can reverse engineer things basically, enough to cause bit flips. And we basically introduced a many-sided row hammer attack. And the idea here at a high level is to hammer many rows so that you can confuse the internal mitigations that try to detect aggressor rows. So there are some proprietary tables inside the DRAM chips called TRR tables. They try to detect aggressor rows, but these are of limited size. They have different replacement policies, et cetera. If you overflow them, those tables do not work anymore. And essentially, we tried to overflow them. We, just, we did just enough reverse engineering to enable these attacks. I will talk about some other work we did where we did a lot more reverse engineering. So basically, uh, we partially reverse engineered the TRR and PTR mechanism, and we provide an automatic tool that can effectively create many-sided row hammer attacks in uh, these chips, as you can see. So what's a many-sided attack? Basically, many-sided attack can look like this. So these are, you, 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 you hammer not just two rows uh, to induce bit flips in uh, the rows around them and the uh, uh, double-sided hammered row, but you hammer three rows or more to confuse the internal protection mechanism because internal protection mechanism may be tracking two rows or three rows or four rows or five rows or 15 rows, right? So you hammer enough rows to confuse and uh, overflow the mechanism. So this is four-sided, for example. And uh, this is very much how many sided attacks you should uh, do to induce bit flips depends on the mechanism that's employed internally. So these are some examples. This is module from manufacturer C. You can see that if you hammer five aggressor rows, you get a lot of bit flips. You can, ham you can get bit flips if you hammer more. So there are some idiosyncrasies that we don't perfectly understand. But if you start hammering more rows, clearly the number of hammerings that you do in each row reduces. So that's, why, that's one of the reasons why you get fewer bit flips. So uh, there, there are trade-offs associated with it. And we don't completely understand in this work what's happening internally. I will later talk about another work where we understand much better. But the takeaway is that you can find uh, hammering patterns that can induce bit flips, even those, uh, even in those chips that are claimed to be protected against row hammer. And if you're really interested, we have this table uh, in this paper where we show that uh, the best pattern that we found and the number of bit flips, etc. You can see, for example, in some cases you have to do 19 sided hammering. 19, you need to hammer 19 rows to overflow the tables to get the best number of bit flips. And in some cases we were not able to figure it out. Later we're going to solve this problem. Okay, and we actually showed that this uh, becomes an issue in real systems and real mobile systems. And we actually were able to find patterns in real mobile systems and launch attacks that are actually reasonably quick, as you can see. So these are different types of rope hammer attacks over here. And you can see that it takes re reasonably short time to actually compromise the system. And for, for more, I would recommend taking a look at the paper. But basically this work shows that 
uh, DRAM chips that are claimed to be protected are not protected against row hammer. You can uh, uh, partially reverse engineer these chips and still cause row hammer bit flips and cause attacks that build on those bit flips. And I believe these results are scratching the surface. The tool that we release is not exhaustive. People can certainly uh, build on it. And in fact, Kaveh's group has built on it. I'm going to mention some works. And I believe there's a lot of room for uncovering more vulnerable chips and phones and systems going forward. But the big takeaway is Robhammer is still an open problem, despite the claims of the manufacturers. And security by obscurity is likely not a good solution. It's better to be on a stage where you say, this is my solution, break it. If you cannot break it, that's great. So being open about these solutions is much better uh, in my perspective. And I think we kind of proved it with experimental. And if you want uh, to see more details on trespass, we have more detailed lectures that go into a lot more detail than what I had to do in this shorter version. Basically, the takeaway is industry adopted solutions do not work. We need to be more rigorous in our solutions. Okay, so I'll uh, pause a little bit to see if there are questions. Otherwise, I'll keep going in the more recent works. We also asked the question, how do you, how do you guarantee that a chip is row hammer free? I'm not going to cover this work. This is a work that we did with Microsoft folks, uh, Microsoft research folks. And there's a lot of interesting data over here. We explore the best row hammering pattern from a general purpose processor here, for example. And we wanted to answer this question. Do you, can we really guarantee on a real system that we are not vulnerable to row hammer? And the answer is no, basically. It's, it's very difficult to come up with a test methodology that is exhaustive enough. And this will be actually uh, exacerbated with our later studies that I'm going to talk about as well. So later, we basically wanted to take these works to the next level, meaning can we completely reverse engineer the solutions that are out in the field? And that's what this more recent work that we published at Micro does. And here, we wanted to really go into the details of the chips. So uh, clearly, target row refresh that's implemented by DR manufacturers is obscure, undocumented, proprietary, and we cannot easily study the security properties of it. And we wanted to have a methodology to study the security properties of things that are implemented in DRAM chips and to validate the security guarantees that are provided. And we developed this methodology that leverages data retention failures to uncover the inner workings of uh, TRR mechanisms and study their security. Basically, data retention failures provide us a side channel. And these failures enable us to figure out whether a DRAM chip is actually performing an internal refresh to fix the row hammer problem or whether it's performing a refresh to actually do a periodic refresh. So we can distinguish these two different refreshes because of our infrastructure. And that distinguishing of the refreshes enables us to gain insight into what mechanisms are employed to drive those row hammer uh, refreshes that are trying to fix the row hammer internal. And it's actually fascinating that you can do that in my opinion. So basically we studied 15 models or modules from three different vendors. And we figured out new row hammer access patterns to, uh, to circumvent the row hammer mitigations. And we basically showed that all 45 modules we tested were vulnerable. And 99.9% .9 of the rows in a DRAM bank experience at least one row hammer bit flip. And you can get up to seven row hammer bit flips in an eight byte data word, making ECC ineffective. Basically, I would, I would say that we completely bypassed uh, the TRR mitigations in all of these chips that we tested. And we, our conclusion is we can, uh, TR does not provide security. It was kind of proven with the TR trespass, but here the results are actually even stronger. And hopefully this will facilitate the development of new attacks and more secure protection mechanisms. Let me quickly give you the overview. I already gave you the basic idea, basically. To be able to do this, you need to use the data retention failures as a side channel to detect when a row is internally refreshed by this proprietary mechanism that's taking place inside the DRAM chip. So to be able to do that, you need to set up an experiment, basically. And the experiment uh, needs you to really figure out uh, which rows are, uh, what are the retention times of different uh, rows and uh, basically uh, induce retention failures or avoid retention failures in these rows uh, and craft access patterns to these rows such that uh, they get refreshed. Uh, and uh, based on this analysis, you can figure out when these rows get refreshed by the internal TR mechanism. To be able to do this, you really need to do, have this FPGA board uh, that we developed to analyze these DDR4 chips. We're going to release this infrastructure very soon, actually, along with the code for uh, uncovering TRR. So stay tuned on that one. So basically, these are the results. Let me give you quickly. Uh, the, the paper has a lot more detail. But uh, we essentially uncovered the different... Sorry about this. I don't know what happened. Okay, my computer refuses to continue for some reason. Okay. Uh, let me go back. Oh. Okay, let me go back here. So basically, 
You can see that uh, there are 15 different modules over here. All of the vendors employ different kinds of detection mechanisms. Some of them count the accesses to 16 rows, for example. Some of them do it per bank. Some of them don't do it per bank. And uh, the, the number of uh, TRR refreshes to periodic refreshes differ across manufacturers. So all manufacturers do different things, basically. And they refresh different numbers of neighbors also. And you can see that some of them sample randomly, like Para does. And the capacity of sampling is only one row. It's not per bank, et cetera. And some of them mix. And some, some, some things we could not perfectly uncover because we'd have limited time, basically. But if you put enough time, I believe, you can uncover these also. So the takeaway is that different vendors employ different solutions, but you can bypass all of them, essentially. You can bypass them to uh, get a lot of vulnerable roads and uh, cause a lot of bit flips. And uh, this is basically the effect on individual roads. You can see, I mentioned this already, uh, so I'm not going to go into detail. The paper is a lot more detailed. In some of them, we were not effective enough because we didn't study those mechanisms as much. In my opinion, if you, if you actually study those mechanisms more, we will get the row hammer bit flip rates to higher. But of course, that remains to be seen. And you can see that uh, bypassing EC, you can easily bypass ECC also with these new row hammer patterns. You can induce up to seven row hammer bit flips and usually more uh, three or more bit flips. And three bit flips is enough to bypass ECC basically. And in almost all cases, we can induce more than three bit flips. Okay, if you really want to have more data on these real chips and their protection mechanisms, I would encourage you to take a look at our paper at Micro. And as I said, we're going to release this code completely, and we're going to release the infrastructure that enabled us to uh, study the DDR4 chips very soon as well on an archive paper soon. Okay, uh, so let me talk about some of the new rogue hammer characteristics that we discovered uh, along these lines, but without the protection mechanisms. And this is another micro paper that I will quickly describe. There are some unstudied aspects of rope hammer that I believe make it even worse and maybe even better for protect, for, from a defense perspective. From an attack perspective, you can craft worse attacks, meaning more effective attacks. From a defense perspective, hopefully you can uh, uh, craft more efficient defenses. If you have insight into three fundamental properties of DRAM, temperature, aggressor row active time, and victim DRAM cells physical location. I will cover these relatively quickly. Again, we use our infrastructure for this, both DDR3 and DDR4-based infrastructure. And we actually enabled very fine-grained control over DRAM commands, timing parameters, and temperature. Our, we actually built a very good temperature infrastructure where we could confidently vary the measurements within uh, accuracy of 0 0.1 degrees Celsius, as you can see. And these are the chips that we tested over here from four major manufacturers in this particular case. Uh, more than 200 DRAM chips in total. Uh, and we started not anonymizing uh, the DRAM manufacturers' uh, names in this paper uh, because at some point it starts not making sense because everybody knows these manufacturers. <laughs> and also the trends are very consistent across different manufacturers. So basically there are a lot of takeaways in the paper, but I'll give you the major takeaways. So a row hammer bit flip is more likely to occur in a bounded range of temperature and every cell is different. So because of the process variation uh, and different cells, different characteristics, Different cells are vulnerable at different temperatures, which is very interesting, I think. Uh, if the aggressor row is activated for a longer time, this also causes a higher vulnerability in DRAM chips. It's also very interesting. For the hypotheses as to why this is happening, you can read the paper. And there's a lot of variation in terms of vulnerability in the DRAM module. Some certain physical regions are a lot more vulnerable than others. So you can now see that these can be used for, for both attacks and defenses. Uh, uh, and let me give you an example. So this is an example attack improvement. So uh, this was what, what, what was done with row hammer before. You activate aggressor rows as frequently as possible. But in this paper, we showed that if you keep the aggressor rows active for a longer time, it's caused a buildup uh, of row hammer effect, let's say. And as a result, the number of activations you need to do to induce the first bit flip reduces. This may sound counterintuitive, but there are circuit level reasons for it that we discussed in the paper. Of course, these are hypotheses, right? These are not proven. There are some papers that talk about these hypotheses, but again, these are based on simulations also. So there's some evidence that discusses why this is the case, but essentially you can reduce the uh, number of activations you need to do uh, to get to the first bit flip if you keep the row hammer, uh, if you keep the row a little bit more active. And this can bypass the defenses that do not account for this uh, reduction basically. Some usually defenses are actually configured because you know the row hammer vulnerability, you know when a bit flip can occur in the worst case. And if that worst case reduces by 36%, then those uh, defenses do not work very well, basically. 
Okay, let me give you the take key takeaways from a spatial variation analysis. It's very interesting, basically. Rope hammer vulnerability significantly varies across DRM rows and columns due to both design-induced variation, systematic variation, and manufacturing process-induced random variation. And the distribution of the minimum actuation count to absorb bit flips exhibits a diverse set of values in a subarray. But within a subarray or across subarrays in the same DR module, they're more consistent. So this can be used to craft better attacks that target these really vulnerable parts and also craft better defenses that protect these vulnerable parts even more. Right? So this is an example. These are, this is a distribution of the rows. You can see different rows and different, uh, 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 yeah, basically this is the minimum activation count to observe bit flips across DRM rows. So this is the minimum activation count to observe a bit flip. These are the DRM rows that are sorted by reduced HC first for in the, inside different modules. So these, each curve is a different module basically for manufacturer C. You can see that the row hammer vulnerability significantly varies across DRM rows. There, there are some rows that are vulnerable a lot. There are some rows that are not vulnerable a lot. Every DRM module exhibits this. And this is true across manufacturers also. And okay, there are different ways of looking at the data. Basically, the takeaway is that a small fraction of DRM rows are significantly more vulnerable to row hammer than the vast majority of rows. This is true for columns as well. Basically, you can see the number of bit flips in a column, the column index, and the chip ID over here. Certain columns are a lot more vulnerable. These yellow ones are a lot more vulnerable over here because you get a lot more bit flips in the column. So how can you take advantage of this? So you can build better defenses. You can leverage the variation across DRM rows. Uh, for those rows that are vulnerable, you can reduce the aggressiveness of the defenses. So you can get better area reduction, more efficient defenses for different proposals that I will discuss in a little bit. Or you can leverage the variation with temperature. Different DM cells experience different bit flips at different temperature ranges. For example, row A experience, experience bit flips in this temperature range. Row B, B experience bit flips in this different temperature range. If you can figure that out, perhaps you disable those rows at different temperature ranges. Clearly, this, uh, uh, provides, this has an overhead on the system, but this is potentially doable. Uh, on the flip side, this makes row hammer testing even worse, meaning the vulnerability of row hammer becomes harder to determine right now because it's dependent on temperature, dependent on every single cell and its location, and it's dependent on how, how often, how, how long you keep an aggressor row open. So the testing to figure out how badly you're vulnerable to row hammer becomes much harder. So there's a flip side to this also, as you can see. Okay, so if you're interested, there's a lot more analyses in this paper. So uh, there's more row hammer analysis coming. Uh, we analyze the effect of word line voltage. I'm going to skip this because we don't have a lot of time. But the takeaway is that row hammer vulnerability can be reduced to some amount via voltage scaling. It doesn't solve the problem completely, but it makes an effect on the problem. And uh, we will discuss that more, maybe. Now, let me uh, jump to the row hammer solution space a little bit. And I will talk about one solution, but I will cover the solution space also. And this is, I think, a comprehensive overview of the solution approaches that we have seen so far. Uh, the first one I think is not easy and not uh, efficient, let's say. So I'm going to ignore that. Increasing the refresh rate is also not efficient. I mean, I'm going to ignore that also. Physical isolation is a solution that's proposed. Basically, somehow the system isolates the rows, uh, aggressor rows from the victim rows. Basically, security critical rows are allocated far away from aggressor rows. If you can do that, it could potentially work. But then the question becomes, what is a security critical row? Can you identify all of them? Can you perfectly isolate? Uh, them from the aggressor rows. I think this is not easy, frankly. And people have shown that this sort of mechanisms have a lot of vulnerabilities. They're not perfectly secure, basically. And the paper that I'm, uh, that I'm going to talk about actually covers that. Reactive refresh actually is a commonly employed solution by the manufacturers also internally. You detect some rapidly activated rows and refresh adjacent rows. Uh, they, uh, if, if, if you're getting closer to row hammer vulnerability, let's say. And this paper introduces an efficient proactive throttling mechanism. Basically, if you can somehow figure out which rows are activated, which rows are being hammered, you can reduce the activation rate to those rows by throttling them in the memory controller. So I think these are actually very interesting solution directions, but there is a huge cost, power, performance, and complexity space that I don't have time to cover, but this uh, work uh, tries to uh, take a crack at this. So let me give you the key ideas of this work and then uh, summer, uh, and then uh, maybe we'll talk about some other issues. So basically, there are two key challenges. Scalability is a problem because row hammer vulnerability is worsening. And we want to have solutions that are as much compatible as possible with commodity DRAM chips. So our goal in this work was to efficiently and scalably uh, uh, solve row hammer without knowledge or modification of the DRAM internals. So the key idea of block hammer is to selectively throttle memory access that may cause row hammer bit flips. And it has two components, row blocker and tack throttler. 
And we use bloom filters to attract row activation rates of different rows. That's what row blacker does. And it blacks us rows that are activated at a high rate and throttles activations targeting a blacklist row enough that you won't get the row hammer vulnerability, basically. No row can be activated at a high enough rate to induce bit flips, and we have a security proof in the paper about that. Attack throttler identifies the threads that perform a row hammer attack based on the information that's coming from the row blocker. It reduces the memory bandwidth usage of these identified threads so that they don't perform this attack. And it can communicate with the operating system such that the operating system can take action on those threads, for example. Uh, basically, this greatly reduces the performance degradation and energy waste of a row hammer attack inflicted on a system. Because one of the issues with row hammer attacks is, okay, if you prevent the row hammer attack, now it can turn to a performance problem. Can you actually prevent the performance problem associated with it as well? Okay, I will not talk about the mm -hmm. results in detail, but uh, performance energy overheads are negligible. And whenever you have an attack, you get much higher performance by throttling that attack and lower energy consumption than state-of-the-art mechanisms. Okay, if for more, uh, I would suggest you take a look at the paper and the paper actually categorizes a lot of the uh, proposed mechanisms, but people are still proposing mechanisms in Rowhammer. So I will argue that my takeaway again is that we need intelligent controllers for security, safety, reliability, and scaling. I will not cover the, uh, these works, but I will mention that there's more work that I didn't get a chance to cover that talks about Rowhammer issues, attacks, and solutions. And you can see that security and privacy conference had a full session on Rowhammer in 2020. Uh, other security conferences, operating system conferences, you can see, uh, look into this. These are some attacks that can, again, take advantage of trespass, for example, to do these uh, Rowhammer attacks from JavaScript. Uh, and I mentioned some of these works. There are some Rowhammer solutions that are being proposed in architecture conferences, as well as security conference, actually. And the upcoming security and privacy conference also has three Rowhammer papers, as you can see. Uh, these are all interesting papers. And the Reliability Physics Symposium also has row hammer papers that talks about how to actually potentially solve the problems. And more recently, actually a few days ago, we released this paper on archive that, where we talk about potential solutions to row hammer where DI manufacturers can pot potentially become more transparent through changes to the interface. And if you're interested, I would recommend taking a look at it. And I believe there's more to come. Okay, how much time do we have? Uh, because I have some more slides, but I would probably want to time things so that we can... Minutes, if you want. Okay, so should I continue? Yeah, if you want, maybe everyone's happy. Yeah, okay, everyone, okay. Everyone's enjoying it, so it's good. Okay, sounds great. Yeah, if you, uh, if you, if you think we're running out of time, feel free to stop me, Hammond. <laughs> no problem with that. Okay, so uh, now that I've covered essentially a lot of the work related to Rollhammer, let me uh, think about the future a little bit. Because future is very interesting, and future is all about technology scaling in the end. Clearly, DRAM is becoming less reliable and more vulnerable because of DRAM scaling, technology scaling issues. And I believe other problems may also appear, or they may be going unnoticed today. So for example, some errors may already be slipping into the field. Clearly, Rob Hammer is an example, but there may be retention errors. That's why I'll talk about retention early on in this talk. Refresh rates are increasing. People are, uh, DRAM manufacturers are putting error correcting codes, as well as increasing the refresh rates. But even then, refresh is a difficult problem, basically. Are there retention errors that are slipping into the field that may be exploited? Are there read errors, write errors? Who knows? I think there's an interesting area of research that to look into these uh, in a forward-looking perspective. And it's not about DRAM only. Flash memory is very interesting. Although it has an intelligent controller that can overcome a lot of these issues, there are emerging memory technologies that may be even more interesting, like phase change memory, STTM RAM, RAM, memristors. There are papers, actually, that talk about the Rohammer vulnerability on STTM RAM that was published in ICCD in 2018, and there are uh, uh, some other papers on related technologies. The question is, uh, what are the other challenges in these memory technologies that could manifest itself as security problems? I believe there will be a lot of challenges, frankly, and I believe you need to really design systems to be fundamentally more secure. And I believe this requires intelligent controllers because intelligent controllers can avoid many failures and also enable better scaling by handling a lot of the failure modes. Refresh is one example, but Rohammer is another example as we will see. So this is my, I don't have the answers. I don't claim to have any of the answers, but I think there's a lot of research to be done in this area. Uh, I believe we need to architect the systems uh, in a more methodical manner. I think we need to really understand what's going on, model things. Uh, and I think we're kind of, do, we've, uh, some of the works that I described, a lot of the works that I described are doing that. Based on real device data and analysis, we need to provide models, technology scaling models, for example, understand the vulnerabilities and develop reliable metrics for both security and reliability. And uh, on top of this, I think we need principal architectures with security as key concern. We need to have good partitioning across the stack. We cannot give up performance and efficiency, unfortunately. 
So a roll hammer solution that reduces DEM performance by 20%, in my opinion, is not acceptable because we actually put a lot of effort to improve DEM performance. And can we have patchability in the field so that if we discover this area in the field, we can solve it by not giving up performance and efficiency a lot. And I think design and test is very important. We need to integrate a lot of these techniques with principal design, automation, and online testing methods. We need to design for security from the ground up for sure. And we need to do online testing periodically, perhaps, to discover are these issues happening uh, and can we actually fix these issues? So uh, just to give you an example of the understanding and modeling, I think these infrastructures are very valuable for understanding and modeling. This is a flash-based infrastructure that I mentioned early in the talk. We've actually built multiple flash memory infrastructures and understood flash memory properties. As a result, you can really understand what's going on in existing flash memories. And this is one example of understanding and building models on flash memory. I've given you the Rohammer examples also, of course. Let me circle back to what we have discussed earlier. This is a bit flip, right, in a real system. I will argue that computing is a lot more bigger problem if, you have, if it has bit flips. And human beings have been building bridges for thousands of years, but we're still having bit flips. So basically, these bit flips are going to happen. Can we somehow prevent them? Uh, I think uh, you can see uh, these are more recent examples. This is Genoa in 2018. I think we have an advantage in computing. Computing is softer than bridges, let's say. We can patch things better. We can make things more programmable. So if you actually have a memory controller that can be patchable, reconfigurable, programmable in the field, you can more easily avoid such failures that you cannot avoid easily on the bridges, let's say. And that's what we argue basically for intelligent controllers. This is the, uh, circling back again. This is the original paper we wrote and we argued essentially these things. And we were not alone. Actually, industry was kind of arguing similar things. This is a paper written by Samsung and Intel. This is actually the only paper that I know was written by Samsung and Intel together. If people know of other papers, please let me know. I'm very interested. And these folks came together and they said, we have a DRAM process scaling problem. They didn't talk about Robhammer at that time because it was not uh, public. We were working on it since 2012. This paper was published in 2014 concurrently with our Robhammer paper. Uh, but basically, uh, they said refresh is a problem, write latencies, variable retention time. All of the retention time errors is a problem. So we should be really building intelligent controllers and DRAM together such that we're solving these problems more holistically, as opposed to controllers not knowing enough information about DRAM and trying to solve these problems. And DRAM not having enough freedom to solve these problems internally without help from the controllers. So if you can collaborate between the controllers and DM, you can have much better solutions, in my opinion. And I believe that people uh, are investigating these solutions. So let me conclude uh, with some final thoughts. It will take uh, a few more minutes, but uh, I like this paper. I don't know if you covered this in your course, but this is what I consider before Rohammer. This was published in IEEE Security and Privacy in 2003. It's a beautiful work. And these folks essentially said that if you have memory errors, you can attack a virtual machine. Essentially, this is part of the work that Google did after they discovered Rovhammer based on our paper. What these folks did was they induced memory errors physically by going to a machine, uh, by having physical access in this particular case, as you can see over here. Uh, and based on these errors, they were able to compromise the guarantees of a virtual machine. They were able to take over the Java virtual machine and .NET virtual machine uh, at that time. Google actually showed that they could actually take over their own virtual machine, basically. Uh, so uh, this, uh, and you can see that they in induce these memory errors with a, a lamp over here, which is actually very interesting. It's a fascinating paper to read, I would say. Maybe it's a paper kind of ahead of its time. I mean, people also looked at cryptographic protocols in 1990s, for example. Dan Bonnet, for example, has some papers that talk about cryptographic protocols not being secure uh, if you can actually induce these fault attacks, memory uh, faults. Uh, but this is a real system demonstration of a fault attack to take over a virtual machine. So. That was before Rohammer. And I think security community was interested, but these papers, I, I don't want to call them, they were on the fringes. They were always interesting, but they were considered not real because this required physical access. But Rohammer changed the mindset a little bit. Now you have a simple memory error that can be induced by the software, right? You don't have to go to the machine to have physical access. So in retrospect, I think uh, this bit flip that is widespreadly inducible by software has enabled a renewed interest in hardware security attack research. Uh, because real memory chips are vulnerable in a simple and widespread manner. This caused real security problems. And the hardware reliability and security connection is now mainstream discourse after Rohammer. And as a result, people have developed many new Rohammer attacks, and you will read about them in the new IEEE Security and Privacy Conference. There are two of them. And there are many papers in both security and architecture venues. And I believe there's more to come as people become more creative and figure out more ways of doing Rohammer and fault attacks. 
I think it's going to be even more interesting. And people are going to propose new row hammer solutions. This is also increasing. And you can see the original works like Apple security release. Memtest actually was the first, the first people to react to our paper was the memory testing folks. This Memtest X86 program is used by many machines. Many, it's a company basically that does memory testing. And they introduced a row hammer test. And after they introduced the row hammer test, they were basically getting a lot of emails from people saying that my memories, uh, my DM fails in these tests. Why? Well, basically because all of the DM, a lot of the DM is vulnerable to row hammer. And there are many uh, solution proposed in top menus also. And I believe principled system DM co-design is really important and there's more to come over here. And maybe perhaps more importantly, this mindset is very interesting because it's, it points to the fact that general purpose hardware is fallible in a widespread manner and its problems are exploitable. And I think this mindset has enabled many system security researchers over the course of last six, seven, eight years to examine hardware in more depth. And I think people should be examining hardware even in even more depth. I mean, I'm not saying hardware security research was not going on before. Clearly, hardware security research was going on. It was very, very interesting to me. But I think it's even more interesting today uh, because people are discovering even more vulnerabilities. For example, Meltdown and Spectre were discovered after Rohammer, and people who worked on Rohammer were... Uh, involved in some of the Meltdown and Spectre works as well. And I believe there's more to come from that dimension as well. As we understand hardware more from a security perspective, we'll find out even more vulnerabilities as has been happening. And hopefully we'll design more secure hardware going into the future. So to conclude, uh, this is my one slide summary. Memory reliability is reducing. Reliability issues open up security vulnerabilities. Rove and these are very hard to defend against if they're discovered in the field. Robham is the prime example. And as I said, it's, I believe, the first example of how a simple hardware failure mechanism can create a widespread system security vulnerability. And I believe its implications on system security research are still very tremendous and exciting. The bad news is Rohammer is clearly getting worse, and it's not going to get better unless we stop scaling DRAM, which I believe is not going to happen because we need higher density DRAM going into the future. That was one of the proposed solutions, right? Why are we scaling DRAM? Well, we need more storage because data is growing in our applications. So that's why we're scaling DRAM. The good news is we have a lot more to do. We're now fully aware that hardware is easily fallible. We're developing both attacks and solutions. That's good, that's a good mindset. But maybe we need to be more open in our solutions and industry as well. And we're developing principled models and methodologies and solutions, which we should keep doing, in my opinion. Okay, I will refer you to papers and uh, more recent lectures for more. And I will definitely thank people who have funded this research. And more importantly, I thank my research group and it's. Uh, the research group that has enabled uh, this research and uh, they uh, uh, can also discuss their research. Actually, two of them, I believe, at least two of them are attending. I didn't check who is attending exactly, but they may be able to uh, answer some of the questions also. And if you're interested in more research that's going in the group, you can take a look at our website and our newsletters. And thank you. Uh, I'm happy to stay as long as you need to answer questions. Thanks very much for that. Uh, okay. Everyone, and that was a, a really genuinely very interesting presentation. Um, so yeah, so I'll open the floor for uh, questions from anyone. Uh, I know Ramesh, you had a question earlier. Yeah, I still remember that. So I, I thank you so much. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay. So you, one of the themes of your presentation is make the controllers intelligent. And uh, you've you presented this a few times. So any progress on that, on that front? And uh, what is the resistance of all of these uh, uh, anecdotal or evidence that you have provided and you and others have provided? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Thank you for the question. So, uh, so the progress actually happened initially. So Intel was the first to react and they added this probabilistic TRR mechanism that's based on probabilistic adjacent row activation in the memory controller. So I think that was a step in the right direction, frankly. But unfortunately, uh, it didn't get a lot of cooperation uh, from the DRAM industry. Uh, so uh, I think uh, that should have been pushed further. At some point, DRAM industry being the DRAM industry, let's say, uh, there are a lot of issues over here, like political issues, business issues. They want to keep a lot of things secret because that's how things evolve. Uh, as a result, they said, Rohammer is our problem and we need, we need to solve it internally. So in a sense, they built a somewhat intelligent memory controller to solve the Rohammer uh, problem internally inside the DRAM. Uh, and if they actually did a perfectly accurate job, that would be a memory controller inside the DRAM specialized for Rohammer and it could solve the problem potentially. But I don't think they did a perfectly good job. And I don't think it's easy to do a perfectly good job 
given that you're constrained by the DM interface today, because the DM interface today is very, very rigid. It's changed in DDR5 with some really, let's say, uh, unintuitive changes to the refresh management, but changes take a long time. For example, DDR5 appeared nine years, almost a decade after DDR4. Uh, so uh, I would argue that people are progressing in the same mindset. So they're putting some intelligence into the memory controllers. Memory control on the memory, on, uh, can be on the memory side, DRAM side, or, or on the processor side. But maybe this is not uh, perfectly enough. We still need some more transparency in the memory controller. And we need to make sure that the algorithms that we employ for security solutions are actually more openly discussed and uh, uh, evaluated, let's say. And maybe putting the entire memory control inside the DRAM is not necessarily good for all of the security issues. Okay, maybe eventually we will solve our hammer somehow. I'm not fully confident about that with the current DRAM interfaces. Uh, in terms of the, from the industry perspective, I think some things are happening to have intelligent memory controllers, but it's limited by the DRAM interface. So the DRAM interface is really limiting the innovation. And it's limited by the fact that the real memory controller that schedules memory operations are on the processor side, manufactured by the processor manufacturer. And the DRAM is on the, uh, the, the uh, uh, let's say uh, DRAM is clearly manufactured by someone else. Uh, and these people don't necessarily agree on what should be done by whom. I, I, I should say that. That's the industry perspective. I think the academic perspective is a lot more open, clearly. There are a lot of papers that are being written on more intelligent memory controllers to fix the raw hammer problem, to handle the refresh problem. So I think from the academic perspective, we can propose new interfaces to DRAM, for example, to solve the raw hammer problem and maybe other problems uh, in DRAM. So I think maybe the long-winded answer to your question, from the industry perspective, I think there's, there are some baby steps from the progress direction. Uh, but maybe more needs to be done. From the academic perspective, I think we are a lot more free to hopefully change the world and maybe the industry will eventually catch up. So just a quick follow on. Uh, the NAND and all those uh, flash memory has done a lot more in terms of intelligence. It's not that yeah. the vendors are, and these are the same companies roughly. So there, yes. still, there is some uh, significant progress there and lots of reluctance on this side, DRAM mm -hmm. versus flash, right? So, yep. They do yeah. know how to do it, but somehow they're reluctant to or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, that's a very good point. So I think this is the difference in the industry. Yes, a lot of the same companies are involved in Flash uh, and more companies are involved in Flash also. But uh, Flash is uh, a much slower technology. DRAM is much closer to the processor, right? Uh, I think uh, processor, once we get closer to the processor, uh, stakes are higher in the sense that memory controller is a very valuable component right now. Once it became the processor vendor's, uh, let's say, domain, uh, it became a lot more valuable in the sense that they don't want to lose it to the other side also. Whereas Flash has always been difficult from the memory vendor's perspective. Flash had always had a lot of reliability problems. So DM, uh, let me give you the mindset uh, from what I gather based on a lot of interactions with DM companies, as well as the system companies also. DM was always assumed to be perfect error-free memory. Ignore the soft errors, right? Soft errors happen once in a blue moon. Yes, if you go to space, they happen a lot more, so you need to harden your memory, etc. cetera. Uh, but more, most of the time, DRAM was assumed to be error-free. Flash was never like that. Flash, from the get-go, from the first manufacturing, there were a lot of errors. So the, I, I believe the Flash vendors had the mindset that, okay, we need help. We cannot solve all of these errors by ourselves, so we're going to open it up reasonably enough so that there will be an ecosystem that enables solving these errors. And that's how the flash industry evolved. Uh, clearly, there were a lot of uh, flash controller manufacturers. A lot of them were extremely innovative, actually. Some startups became part of big companies like Seagate later on, etc. cetera. Uh, I, I think this, it's, it's really an evolution of the industry. Uh, and I believe we are seeing that uh, unfortunate evolution of the DRAM industry here as well. People are, are used to some status quo in DRAM uh, it's hard to change the mindsets. I don't know if that gave you some insights into no, what's you. happening. Yeah, sure, you're welcome. So one of the uh, follow-on questions, so uh, unrelated to the, the CMOS uh, DRAM technology, do you see any, uh, you mentioned some of the technologies like RAM and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, which of these is a more promising technology and are <laughs> there any interesting security vulnerabilities beyond Rohammer or including mm -hmm. Rohammer, for example? Yeah. Uh, 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 RAM, maybe. 
Yeah, yeah, that's that's a that's a billion dollar question. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, yeah, certainly a lot of people are examining all these emerging technologies, and I think people should examine. I, I don't frankly know the answer uh, as to which one is more or less promising. I think, for example, we did a lot of work on phase change memory and STTM RAM. I believe they're both very interesting. I know less about our RAM, uh, mm -hmm. and I think that's also very promising. There's also racetrack memories, etc., uh, even more emerging uh, memories. I think uh, in the end. Uh, my high level perspective is that uh, DRAM is very difficult to replace. That's what we found with uh, uh, our research in phase change memory. And I believe that's what people have found, at least with the initial incarnation of the Optane persistent memory, right? Uh, Intel released, uh, let's say, what could potentially be a DRAM replacement with their, per, uh, with their Optane memory that could be used directly in the memory slot. And it's not good enough, as good as DRAM in terms of latency characteristics, in terms of endurance characteristics. Uh, I believe that's true for a lot of the other memories also, frankly. We're not there yet in any of the memories, but this doesn't mean that we cannot be there going into the future. But DRAM will, I think, uh, have, have steam for a really long time, in my opinion. It, it can be augmented by some of these memories. Now, the security and reliability issues of these other memories, I think uh, all of them have a lot of interesting issues. And uh, there are papers that are published in many conferences. I mentioned that some papers looked at Rohammer and STTM RAM, for example. There are write disturbance issues, for example. Not, Rohammer is a read disturbance issue but you can have write disturbance issues in some of these emerging technologies, phase change memory being one of them. And that could potentially be exploited for security. Now, I, uh, I, don't, I haven't seen a lot of works in this direction. Uh, and the works that, uh, the few number of works that are in this direction are usually based on simulation because we don't really have real memories except for Intel Optane or the real memories we have that people have access to. Uh, they don't really, or they're not really allowed to do this sort of security studies or at least allowed to publish them let's say. Uh, so I think uh, it's, it's very interesting to explore the security aspects of these emerging memories. I absolutely agree, but it's a difficult space also to do research in. Uh, and, and there are also other issues like endurance issues, right? Uh, a cell, for example, fails after some number of writes in a lot of these technologies, especially phase change memory. And that could potentially turn into a security attack, wear out attacks that people have discussed in literature in the past. Uh, so I think it's a very fruitful direction. Uh, I have a question uh, which is coming via Slack. So we have a class Slack as well as the Zoom. Uh, so one thing that's not completely clear for me, how does the Paris solution scale to work with smaller DRAM technology nodes? And yeah. is it still relevant when technology scales down? Yeah, yeah. so that's a good question. I, I kind of mentioned this. Uh, maybe I can have backup slides. I think I may have a backup slide on this one. Basically, it doesn't scale very well. Let me put it that way. And we showed that in our paper. So this is uh, one uh, solution, uh, one, one graph in our paper, as you can see. Uh, basically, we evaluated a bunch of mitigation mechanisms that were published until 2020. One of them is para. Two of them are based on para, MR, lock, and pro hit. Uh, and two of them are, one of them is different from para and increase the refresh rate. So you can see on the x-axis, we see number of hammers required to induce the first row hammer bit flip. As you go from left to right, technology is scaling down to smaller technology nodes, denser DRAM chips. And this is the normalized system performance impact of the solution that we examined. So this is DDR3 and this is LPDDR4, the latest chips that we tested. And these are the points based on our testing, basically, number of hammers. So you can see that increasing the refresh rate across the board is not great. It causes a lot of performance degradation if you want to get rid of every single bit flip. Para is not bad, but its performance overhead is starts increasing as the row hammer vulnerability starts increasing. For example, here, you get a bit flip after 100 row hammer, after 100 hammers, 100 activations. Okay, yes, it's a bit aggressive, but that's where we're going today uh, into the future. So the overhead of para becomes basically unreasonable at some point uh, to get rid of every single bit flip. I should mention that. If you can tolerate bit flips, that's a different question, of course. But the overhead of some other mechanisms are also not so good. This is the ideal mechanism, for example, twice at, as at that time it was proposed. It's also not so good over here. And the ideal mechanisms overhead uh, this is ideal mechanism basically, ideally knows which rows to refresh uh, and it refreshes them at the right time. Even its overhead is uh, increasing over time, but it's much better than existing solutions. So I'm not arguing that pair is a great solution as technology scales, but augmented with some other solutions, it could potentially be part of the equation. Oh, thank you. Sure, you're welcome. Any other questions? In the room?
I have a bit of a, a, a different picture, which is sort of building on Ramesh's technology. Most of my research is on microcontrollers that are all using SRAM. Is there any attack like that, that's similar to Rohammer that works on SRAM, or is SRAM generally pretty safe? Okay, that's a, that's also a great question. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, so okay, uh, from uh, from a fundamental perspective, all memory is uh, vulnerable to disturbance errors, and actually, people uh, have have shown that SRAM is also vulnerable to disturbance errors when you scale down to smaller sizes. Now, this is experimental using simulation, of course, but uh, it's not clear if there is a real world demonstration of Rohammer errors in SRAM. I, I haven't seen that uh, in the field. And there could be multiple reasons for it. Uh, people may already have found solutions uh, to it uh, because SRAM is actually a less dense memory technology to begin with. Uh, it's less dependent on the capacitor. The, part, uh, the paths that cause their disturbance may be easier to alleviate. And that's my opinion. Uh, and also, usually SRAM employs, uh, because it's, uh, uh, it's not in an extremely cost-sensitive technology, because you already pay a lot of cost for the SRAM, right? You can also pay even more cost for error correction. Right. Basically, uh, error correction is usually uh, coupled with SRAM uh, chips, microcontrollers, etc. Uh, so those error correction, error correcting codes may be protecting against a lot of these Rohammer errors potentially. Okay. Uh, one other question on the Slack: Is there anything you can do from the software or operating system level to prevent the attack, kind of uh, at, a, at a much higher level? Yeah, yeah. So that's, a, that's also a great question. And people have investigated that. Let me go back to the slide where I talk about uh, Rohammer solutions over here. Let's see. Where is it? Okay, this one. I think this one is a good one to talk about. So for example, uh, um, I think... Which one over here? Maybe I... Yeah, basically, there are some solutions that are in the software uh, uh, that... Uh, so for, for example, some of the physical isolation. A lot of the physical isolation solutions are software-based, meaning you isolate the security critical data. Uh, if I go back to this uh, picture, you isolate the security critical data. You, you don't allocate uh, the victim rows, potential victim rows that are security critical, closer to rows that may have activity. Basically, you separate the security critical data from other rows. If you can do that, I think this can work. Unfortunately, this may not be easy to do as I discussed. Uh, there are also some other solutions, uh, which uh, I don't see over here. But they have software performance counters, for example. They try, to, uh, they try to, using software performance counters, they try to figure out which rows are being attacked. And if they actually see that there is an attack going on based on the performance counters, they can throttle uh, the process, essentially. They deschedule the process, for example. Uh, they can throttle it such that it doesn't access memory as much, etc. So these solutions are published. Uh, there's always the question how uh, secure they are. And, uh, Clearly, with the, some of the physical isolation solutions, later papers show that they're not secure enough, basically. And we discussed them uh, in this paper. That's basically this comprehensive protection domain over here. Some of them are not secure enough. So a lot of the software solutions have the problem that uh, you need to react very quickly to the number of hammers. Okay, if the number of hammers is, let's say, 100,000, okay, maybe you can react relatively quickly. If the number of hammers to induce bit flips becomes 4,000, 2,000, then it becomes very difficult to react basically. You need some hardware support, at least to invoke the software to do something about it. So I think it's good to investigate these software solutions, but my perspective on pure software solutions is it's going to be a bit difficult to handle the problem as the number of hammers to, um, um, a number of activations to induce a row hammer bit flip reduces over time. Uh, is there anything that's looking at like a moving target to fix where maybe, uh, you know, if you I don't know the way, quite way to word this question. Like, um, move the rows around. Yeah, can we move rows around so that security okay. and the rows and stuff are continuously changing locations within the direction? Yeah, yeah. So that's a good question also. I think uh, the one paper in ASPLOS this year talks about this. This is trying to move the papers around. Uh, not papers around, sorry. Move the rows around so that not one single row. I think there's some merit to this idea. Uh, the difficulty is I think there's overhead also, right? Uh, I would recommend people to look at this paper. Uh, the paper has its own analysis, uh, but moving rows around always uh, takes some overhead in the end. Uh, so it's good to, I think, uh, analyze these works maybe two years down the road to see what the overheads look like uh, going into the future, frankly. Also data coding, coding the data rather than just store it in the way it is. So you 
three different patterns. Does that make sense? I don't repeat the game. So, well, so what do you mean by data coding? This is so not the air, this is not the error correction, right? No, it could be error correction and so on, but randomly instead of taking taking a uh, pattern and just jumbling it up into something that not even error correction, some random codes, some, not a systematic code, would that work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I it's, it's, uh, <laughs> because once you have the systematic codes, they may not work because you have assuming randomness of the errors. Yeah. So thinking of it in a slightly different way where the code or the attacks are more systematic more systematic. So I see. I see. Be the other way around. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe if, if you have enough insight into the attacks, can you somehow code the data? I'm not sure. I mean, I haven't thought about it enough, frankly. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I think, I mean, my perspective on, on error correcting codes, not necessarily the one you suggested, but I think error correcting codes, as you said, is very good for random errors, right? Uh, I'm not sure if uh, scaling the error correcting codes will be easier with raw hammer. Let's say you have, let's say, 500 bit flips uh, or, or 10 bit flips. Uh, do we really want to invest a lot of uh, our real estate to air correcting codes? I'm not sure, frankly. I think it's a lot of overhead, yeah. frankly. But maybe there is some other way of encoding the data such that roll hammer bit flips become fundamentally less likely. That I haven't thought about, frankly. That goes back to the uh, data pattern, right? Uh, that's the slides I showed where some data patterns are more likely to induce bit flips and some data patterns are much less likely Exactly. Uh, news bit flips. Yeah. Uh, now that depends on your encoding. Uh, can you come to an encoding that actually reduces the error rate significantly enough, like two orders of magnitude, etc.? I don't know at this point. That requires some investigation. Uh, but it will also come with the overheads of encoding, right? You need to decode as well. Yeah. Yeah. But that's interesting, I think. It, uh, it, it requires some thought. Yeah, I was thinking of some simple table lookups. If you have some interesting patterns that you want to avoid, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. not not the expensive systematic uh, coding, like coding is just yeah. Parts. So in yeah. terms of the tooling itself that you have, the test bed that you have, I, uh, so you said it's uh, accessible, right? You gave us some links on your slides. Yes, yes. So uh, the tool certainly. I mean, if people are interested in doing the sort yeah. of testing that we do. Uh, we uh, So I'm, let me go back to the link. So the DDR3 infrastructure is accessible and people have been using the DDR3 infrastructure actually to do a lot of interesting studies. Uh, there are papers uh, published based on the infrastructure. So this is the link basically. Uh, you can find it on our GitHub, uh, SoftMC it's called. Uh, and uh, it's relatively easily usable. But as I said, we're going to actually release a new version of it that works for DDR4 as well, more recent chips. Uh, uh, so hopefully people uh, can use it. If people are interested, they can check our uh, GitHub site. And I believe this will be available in the, uh, in the coming month, let's say. Okay. Yeah, uh, I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, it's, it's a bit far away, but yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, so can you give some insights or point to some papers where uh, it will explain how ASLR is circumvented in the practical attacks based on raw power? Because it, I, I like very interesting it is like it sounds like with ASLR, like it would be very difficult to understand which rows are added in the physical memory and and to practically. Um, do this, but uh, it's obvious it's been done, so I would like to read more. Address space layout randomization. Yeah. ASLR. Okay, uh, so I didn't fully get the question, but if I understand it correctly, you want pointers to some papers that describe these attacks? No, so what he wants to see is uh, if ASLR is a viable solution against Pro Hammer. Oh, I see. Or if it is not. And yeah, papers that show why it is not. Kind of I see. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, you can, you can look at uh, some of the papers uh, from Kaveh Razavi's group uh, that uh, talk about some of those real issues like ASLR. But it's, uh, I mean, ASLR basically randomizes uh, certainly the rows, but the row still stays in the same physical area, right? And you can, you can basically, there, there are people, there, there are a lot of papers who, that show that you can also reverse engineer a lot of the ASLR mechanisms. Uh, 
so you can break, uh, break that down into pieces. But if you want to really have pointers to papers, I would suggest looking at Kaveh Azavi's papers. Uh, I don't know the exact ones at this point. If you email me, I'm happy to uh, point you to uh, the papers. Uh, but there are a lot of papers in that uh, area. So ASLR really doesn't solve the uh, uh, Rohammer problem. Okay. Yeah, please email me if you want to have specific papers, if you cannot find them. Has anyone else got any questions, either on the person or on Zoom or in Slack? Well, Nuri, as always, uh, thank you. Uh, he's an excellent educator. Anytime you ask him to give a talk anywhere, he's ready. And uh, always a high energy presentation. Uh, a lot of material and always insight. Thank you so much. That's uh, a personal thank you. For me. Okay, thank, thank you very much, for Ramesh and Hammond, for inviting me. Uh, thank you very I'm happy much. To, yeah, I'm happy to share the slides if you're interested. I'll send them to you. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, we can put them on our bright space for the students. Okay, sounds great. Thanks. Yes, thank you so much again for joining us. Yeah, thank take you. care. Okay.